Thanks, Sarah. Sarah. I'm, I'm glad you learned something at TCU. <laughs> we, we try to be a full-service university. Um, before I begin, I, I did want to say that um, uh, I've been really impressed with the talks myself. In fact, I was sitting there thinking, gosh, I, I wish I didn't have to get up. It would be nice to just hear what's coming down the road. They've been really good, really provocative, and I uh, keep thinking about things that came up. And also there's some overlap, I think, with some of the things I'm going to be talking about, particularly with, um, in terms of Francine's talk and also uh, Eleanor's a little bit as, as well. One of the things I was thinking about, though, with the uh, controversy art and the panel discussion or presentations was um, the Marcus Aurelius, some of you may know this, uh, but the Marcus Aurelius sculpture is the only pre-Christian uh, uh, bronze sculpture of a, a Roman, a pre-Christian Roman emperor. And the only reason it survived um, in the Middle Ages when a lot of Roman works were destroyed was in the 8th century, the Pope declared, as he put it in front of the cathedral in Rome, St. John Lateran, that it was now the sculpture of Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor. <laughs> So one way to solve a controversy, it's not Robert E. Lee, it's horse with rider. Just a thought. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor, and, and one of the pleasures really is uh, having Sarah Beth introduce me. Um, it, it's always gratifying to have a student who goes on and does really well and heads an organization uh, and it's a you know, great curator, so it's, it's delightful for me, but it's also an honor uh, to be here. Um, originally, I was going to call this Recollections of Mac Trotter because um, I taught with him for 11 years uh, at TCU. Um, I realized if I called it Recollections, this would be about a five-minute presentation, um, even though we worked together daily uh, for uh, 11 years, so I'm reflecting in, instead. Um, I also, after Eleanor's talk this morning, was really tempted to change the title uh, to something she said in the course of her talk. She said, um, uh, what the heck happened when she was talking about the 1950s? What's going on in the 1950s? Um, and I thought that would have been a great title for this because I'm going to be dealing with an artist who was really very well known uh, in the 1950s and into the early 60s. Um, in Texas, regionally and nationally. Um, but then in the 70s, as interest in art shifted and so forth, um, he you know, stopped ex exhibiting on the scale he had before. But it's, I think it's a good case study in an artist's work that um, there's been a revival of interest in his work since um, at least uh, 2008, if not sooner. Actually, in, in 2005, one of our MA students, Morgan Womack, wrote, a, wrote her thesis, MA thesis, on Trotter with the intention of, of making an exhibition, which didn't happen, but she wrote a great thesis. In 2008, uh, Bill Rees uh, Gallery, um, I guess maybe it was Sarah, it wouldn't have been Sarah then, but Bill Rees Gallery uh, did a, a Mac Trotter uh, exhibition. Uh, Katie Edwards wrote a really nice introduction um, in, in the catalog brochure uh, for that. Um, and then just recently, this earlier this year, there was another exhibition that we did at TCU, which I'll, I'll talk about um, in, in just one second. Uh, but I'm st uh, starting with these two images, which are a little hard to read. This is a dark painting anyway. It's a portrait of someone named Ezra from 1946. And this is, you know, what the heck happened. Um, he starts in this very realist vein and moves to abstraction, which is not unusual in the mid-20th mid century for any artist anywhere um, that wants to be a modern artist to begin to move uh, into abstraction. Uh, the title begins to find the true reality, and this comes from a statement that Trotter made in a 1954 um, exhibition. It was a solo exhibition he had at uh, what is now called the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth in the 50s. It was called the Fort Worth Art Center. Uh, and the, the full uh, quotation that this is part of, he says, all things are abstract. It is our job to find the true reality. And I, I think, just to 
interject. I think when he's using the word reality, he's using it the way Francine was talking about a kind of universality, uh, moving beyond regionalism, embracing that sensibility, but also encompassing something uh, larger. And he goes on to say, my way is to start with abstraction and search for realism, which sounds backwards, but again, realism means universality. And he says, which seems to me to exist uh, in the forms uh, at hand. So I'm going to quickly survey his work and talk about um, his ambitiousness, which he really quite he was for the period. Um, the range of his work, this is also to set up a kind of diversity of styles. Throughout his career, he's going to be um, not so much moving from realism to abstraction, he does that clearly, but working both in, a, in, a, in one composition oftentimes. Um, there's some totally abstract works, but I would say the majority of his work uh, is a kind of combination of abstracted elements. You can recognize some forms, um, uh, but they're, they're highly uh, abstracted. As I said, um, let's see, there. Uh, part of my ongoing interest and in, was renewed uh, the, in, in his work uh, he died in 1999, retired from TCU in 1988. Um, we had an exhibition in our, one of our galleries at TCU in January and February, uh, kind of a small retrospective of his work. And this was the uh, product of our five first year MA students. They're, they were charged with, um, and I was the one who charged them, uh, with creating an exhibition. And normally, the students have to come up with their own subject based on collections TCU had. And I told them that, no, this, they didn't know they, that was the past. I said, uh, you're going to do an exhibition on Mac Trotter. They had no idea who he was. They had never heard of him. Um, and I felt kind of bad doing it by fiat. Uh, but it had already been decided the spring before um, that we would do a show on the 100th anniversary of his birth. And um, Bill Reeves approached me and, and he was saying, you know, it's the 100th anniversary, you should really do something. And they, the gallery, he and Sarah Fultz would be glad to, you know, help in any way they could. And they did, in fact. They were tremendously helpful and tremendously encouraging to the students. And we all went down to Houston one day and the students picked out work there. Um, we also had a number of private collectors who lent work, which was really nice, and the students. It was a really good experience for them because I gave them pretty much full reign. They had to come up with the subject within, uh, you know, the idea of Mac Trotter. Okay, what are you going to do? They had to contact the uh, private collectors. They had to pick the works of art. They had to install it. They had to write um, uh, catalog essays. And I do have, if anyone's interested at the end, um, I have copies of the, the catalog brochures. If anybody would like one, I'd be glad to give you one. Um, they had to write a press release, education programs developed, and so forth. So it was a, a really good experience for them. Um, and they felt really good, I think. And I heard, over, overheard one of them say, uh, when they were working in the uh, library one day, oh, that looks like a trotter. And he flipped it over and he goes, it is. I know his work now. Uh, so they, they became very um, uh, invested uh, in it as we uh, went along. As I mentioned, um, uh, when I came to TCU, Mac Trotter had been there for about 20 years at that point. Um, he was actually on the hiring committee uh, for the position that uh, I received there. And um, I worked alongside him. His office was right across the hall from my um, for uh, 11 years, as I say, I was uh, looking back through um, uh, the yearbooks, and I thought, I wonder if his picture's in a yearbook. It must be, because everyone used to do that. No one does it anymore. Um, and I looked back, and um, these are two people you might not recognize. Um, the one on the left is me, <laughs> and the one on the right is Mac Trotter. Um, neither look very familiar to me. Um, but the image of Mac particularly doesn't look familiar. Um, I never saw him looking like that. And I think that's probably a photograph uh, from the 60s or something that, um, knowing Mac, he probably just sent that into the yearbook. And probably they had been, I, I should go back to 1964 and see if it's there, and it's there every year. Uh, he never aged, I guess. 
Um, I, I was very youthful looking, so I thought a lumberjack beard uh, was the way to go. Uh, and, um, but anyway, uh, the image I have of Mac is this. Um, this is a, a photograph taken by Luther Smith, Smith, who was a photographer on the, in the department at the time for a, a catalog we did for the Department of Art and Art History in, in 1987. Uh, and to me, this really captures a good sense of, of the man. Um, he did retire the next year. He had been there for 35 years. Um, one of his paintings uh, behind him. Uh, he always wore this jacket. It's sort of a quasi um, safari slash fly fishing jacket slash artist jacket. Um, he always had, you know, the plastic holder for pens and pencils uh, in his lapel. He always had a cigarette. It's, he's sort of hiding it. There's a cigarette holder there. He always smoked a cigarette with a cigarette holder. Um, the one thing is missing is that he wore a beret. He's the only artist I know that actually wore a beret. <laughs> and I remember standing in line for some TCU event one time, and he was like two people ahead of me, and there were some students behind, and, and I heard one of them say to the other, hey, look at that guy. He's an artist. He's got to be an artist. He's got a beret. <laughs> and I said, it's so easy to be an artist. Uh, you just need a beret. But um, he was a no-nonsense person. He kept a fairly low profile, at, the, at least at this point, um, uh, in the department. Uh, he was, though, um, uh, an extremely gracious individual. Everyone talked about him in those terms. Uh, former students at the exhibition referred to his manner as being sort of courtly. He was from Georgia, and he had the wonderful sort of lilting Georgian soft uh, accent. Uh, I never heard him raise his voice. Um, which was no small uh, feat uh, to, to do at that time because um, during the late 70s and early 80s, uh, our department um, was um, individualistic, uh, eccentric, and exciting, all of which is academic speak for totally chaotic. Um, everyone was at everyone's throats. Um, they were doing dumb things like having an untenured faculty member become the chair, me, <laughs> in the midst of this. They had an untenured faculty member dumb enough to do it. Um, and Mac was, bless his heart, he would always, not always, but he would come by my office and kind of look in and go, how's it going? And I go, <laughs> it's going, and he just kind of smiled and then walked off. Um, but he, he was, um, also as a teacher, he, uh, wasn't one of these really dynamic, charismatic teachers, but um, for certain students, they, they really admired him. He had a manner about him. Um, as he talked with students, studio practice typically, your one-on-one -on -one situations, you spend time with all your students, and that certainly was true of Mac. Um, a couple of the students, former students of his who've gone on to become artists, now speak very fondly of him, um, and they, they've said to me that at the time, they didn't really get what he was saying. In fact, they didn't really think he was teaching. And then they said, later, it kind of clicked. And, you know, like this bulb went off. I, I get what he was um, uh, doing. Uh, I didn't recognize it at the time. He, uh, as I mentioned, was born in Georgia, and he studied at the University of uh, Georgia for graduate school. He went to William & Mary undergraduate school and graduated in 1940. Um, he made his way eventually to Fort Worth in 1948, uh, teaching first at Texas Wesleyan College, as it was called then. And this is a clipping for them from the Star-Telegram Fort Worth newspaper. Uh, it, it, the heading is, painting is easy. You know, painting is always put down. It's always the last thing on the local news for the last two minutes left, and it's a joking kind of thing about, you call this art. Um, and same in newspapers, but it goes on to say, uh, at least McKee Trotter, um, he's head of the art department at TWC, um, uh, made it seem easy with his casual, good-natured manner of giving uh, an art education lecture and a demonstration. And in fact, that's a good characteristic of him, his kind of easygoing uh, manner. Um, 
one of the um, great things about working on the exhibition was that um, we had the good fortune of working closely with uh, his children, um, and particularly Holly uh, Trotter Crochet, who, Crochet I should say, um, who has the family uh, uh, archives in a storage unit in Fort Worth. And they were a real boon because uh, he was very good about filing things away, clippings. And I was stunned by how many times he was in the newspaper uh, in Fort Worth and also in Georgia and, and written about in the New York Times, the New York um, Herald, Tribune, um, uh, Art News, Art in America, and, and so forth. Uh, I really had no idea. Again, Mac and I, when we talked, um, our subjects always seemed to be about, you know, Boy Scouts. He was a big participant in Boy Scouts in his mature age, and I had been a Boy Scout. Uh, and the fact that our birthdays were really close to each other. Um, but we almost never talked about art, which I was thinking about that, and it, it's, I think that's probably true of a lot of faculties. Um, you know what people are doing, but you don't often, unless you, you know, if you're an art historian, you're gonna write a critical essay or something, engage them in conversation. I was reminded of an episode of, uh, many years ago. I was writing an uh, essay about Robert Motherwell and my brother who lived in California said, oh, I know a guy who knew Motherwell in 1950 in New York. He was a young painter and he met Motherwell and Pollock and all that. And I said, great, can I interview him? He said, oh yeah. And so I, I talked to this man, we had a really nice conversation. And he said, you know, he was this young 21 year old, went off to New York and went to the Cedar Bar and drank with all the you know, artists you were supposed to meet. And I said, well, what did, what did you learn from Motherwell? And he looked at me and he goes, well, the one thing I remember he said, this actually relates to Sarah's comment. Uh, he, he said, Motherwell said, never drink cheap wine. And that was the takeaway from, you know, what I thought was this incredible kind of opportunity. And it made me feel sort of the same way. There was this guy who had been so involved uh, in Fort Worth in the 1940s and 60s. I mean, really a major figure within that art community. And he never let on that any of that had happened. And only once I had heard um, another painter, Jim Woodson, on our faculty. Um, uh, we had an art critic from New York come in, Dory Ashton, and Jim was talking with her and he said, do you remember Mac Trotter? You wrote about him. Um, uh, his review, I think it was an anonymous um, review that appeared in the New York Times. But at any rate, um, I've learned so much about him. Uh, it's, it's actually been kind of wonderful. Uh, a later uh, image, uh, clipping from 1951, uh, entitled Printmakers, and it's showing uh, Trotter on the um, uh, left-hand side. He's got that coat on. He's moving into the 50s. It must have been a 50s coat. He's got a sort of lab coat on here. And now he's, he's got his regular outfit. Uh, Bill Bomar and uh, Leah Quilty, uh, Quilty, who were uh, part of the Fort Worth Circle. And he became part of the Fort Worth Circle. And he was uh, a little bit younger than some of them. And sort of if there was a second wave, that might be how to characterize him. But he was very much involved with this group of people. But again, I was surprised by how often he d appeared in the newspapers. Um, this is from the Atlanta newspaper, the Constitution in 1946, and it's talking about him winning um, a fellowship from Pepsi-Cola in the 40s, and I think, I think it stopped in the early 50s. Uh, Pepsi-Cola sponsored an annual national competition um, for painters, and there were major artists who showed, and they also gave awards to upcoming young artists um, from different regions. They divided the country into seven regions. And Mac Trotter won the award um, in 1946. It was, the award was good for 1947, um, that fellowship. And it allowed him to um, travel to New York and it allowed him to work on paintings. Uh, at this moment, he's um, uh, just finishing up. Well, not really, he's, he's got four more years to work on his uh, thesis, but he's a graduate student now. Uh, I'll come back to this image because it, 
it's important. He studied with Lamar Dodd uh, in University of Gen in Georgia, who was really a mentor to him. There's some wonderful correspondence between Lamarck and uh, Lamar Dodd. And Lamar Dodd was, again, sort of a name that loomed fairly large in the 1940s and 1950s and sort of uh, forgotten uh, about today in some ways. This is a self-portrait of him, uh, 1936. And then a, uh, one of uh, pages from Trotter's uh, many sketchbooks that have survived uh, showing Lamar's pipe. Um, and it, it's, when you look at it, the pipe is really all wrong. Um, it, it's kind of funny. But that he's showing this is fascinating because I don't, you, it's hard to read in the portrait, but he's got this pipe, kind of a Sherlock Holmes pipe that curves around. Um, and I would say in 97% of the photographs and paintings that show Lamar Dodd, he's got that pipe. Uh, so for him to just draw that pipe um, was, was really, in a sense, it's a portrait of uh, his mentor uh, and, and acknowledging it through that kind of, of uh, uh, device. He also did, um, he had a very traditional um, art education, which was typical of the period. Um, the thing that was a little bit unusual is that uh, he's now in graduate school uh, working with Dodd on his MFA. MFA was a fairly new degree. Um, it really kicked in particularly after World War II uh, and largely through the uh, GI Bill that allowed um, more mature students to go back to school. They went to graduate school and the MFA uh, became a more popular degree than it ever had been before. But at Georgia they had a very uh, traditional uh, you know, working from a plaster cast, working from new models, looking at art, knowing about the history of art. So in one of his pages, um, there's this, he's done a self-portrait of Peter Paul Rubens, the Baroque 17th century painter. On the other, and again, it sort of shows his, you know, he's looking at this 17th century image, and then he's also just looking at what's around um, the University of uh, Georgia in Athens, and it's hard to read, but it's an automobile and their buildings. It's just a street scene, and he's interested. And Dodd really pushed this. He pushed tradition, but he also pushed um, the idea of, of looking what's out there. Just you know, look at your environment uh, and take from it um, what you uh, can. He might he makes a note here, or there's a, a inscription underneath it with an arrow. And uh, it's written by Lamar Dodd. He said, why not make a painting of this? Uh, so he's been, this is a notebook he submitted. Um, and his teacher is making a comment that this should, in fact, be um, uh, worked up. Uh, it's really fascinating in this notebook. When you turn the page of this self-portrait of this you know, very famous artist, there's a self-portrait of Trotter um, shaving as a young man. Um, and it's hard to read in this image, but there's, you know, Rubens is bearded, so I can't help but think he's doing this self-portrait, sort of mocking or making fun of this work. He's this scrawny young man who's now shaving. And he did, he did some uh, sort of humorous works. The sketchbook also has um, a caricature of Lamar Dodd, where his head is greatly expanded, and uh, uh, Trotter was very careful to write caricature. Uh, at the bottom of it. He was um, in the military in 1940, right after he graduated from uh, William & Mary. Uh, he majored, by the way, in art in French, and he, he taught French at the University of Georgia be, uh, because he didn't have any openings for teachers in the art department. So he taught uh, French for uh, several years. Um, he uh, enrolled there in 1941 in the graduate school, in 1942, um, he, or 43, 42, he was called to active duty uh, during World War II. And he uh, went to officer's candidate school, um, went to Europe uh, in, 19, in September of 1944 as a, a lieutenant, and almost immediately was captured by the Germans and in a POW camp until the end of the war in 1945. And there are a few drawings that are really kind of yelled in some cases. Uh, that he did, and in fact, he sort of kept a diary. Um, and he would draw on any scrap of paper he could find. Uh, he would write about how his hands were freezing and he, he was having a hard time drawing and so forth. Um, you can't really read what this says, but it's referring to someone in a Polish 
uh, the Germans had marched them all over. They were always on the march. And they were in a uh, officer's uh, POW court, uh, camp in Poland. And this one, uh, Refugees, is the title of the 1945 drawing showing anonymous people in ruinous cities. And on the right, um, an image that is uh, uh, showing uh, what he calls a two-hole burner, a stove. Um, and then he, he uh, in, goes on and writes fire material, which are bed boards, red cross boxes. Uh, this is in the American compound in Germany in April 1945, which is when he finally um, is uh, released, returns, re-enters graduate school uh, in Georgia, but takes this drawing and makes it into a fair, it's, the painting is about the size of this slide. And he's encouraged by Lamar Dodd to enter the Pepsi-Cola competition. And so he does, and he sends in several paintings. This is one of them. Um, and they gave him the award, not for this painting, but for the, the uh, body of work. But he always thought of this painting very much in terms of that uh, Pepsi-Cola um, fellowship. This is the cover from uh, the third annual exhibition of Paintings of the Year, it was called. And again, this is a wide, they're wonderful catalogs to look at to see a breadth of modern art in America, because it, it was a very national um, exhibition. Artists uh, from all over uh, were selected. And in fact, it, um, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, this was the, the painting that won for the competition, the first place prize, What Atomic War Will Do to You. Um, there were a number of paintings, this is right after the end of the war, that dealt with the war. So Trotter's work, in, in a way, it was a very savvy work um, uh, to submit. Although when he submitted it um, the next year, because he was painting it for 1947, they would give him an exhibition at the 1947 annual in New York. Um, they did not include this work uh, within it. Well, it's fascinating to me to look at the range of artists that are in this exhibition. And even though he's not in Texas and doesn't know he's going to be in Texas, um, there were Texas artists included um, in this exhibition. There were four of them. And you're looking at um, an uh, Everett uh, Spruce work and a, a Donald uh, Vogel uh, work. There was also work by Otis Dozier, uh, Robert Prusser, uh, and Clara Will Williamson, quite a range. Um, I'm showing these in black and white because they were actually reproduced in the catalog uh, in uh, black and white. And so this is him working on this body of work that he's submitting now in 1947 that will be shown at the National Academy of Design where Pepsi-Cola had their annual competition. And he was told to paint five works uh, based on what he did during his fellowship year. Uh, so he's at work on one work that um, can be identified as a painting called uh, At Five. And this was one of the works that um, also uh, was among the group that was shown uh, in New York. It's entitled uh, Intersection. Um, the paintings were uh, the four, they asked for five and then they scaled back to four. They all dealt, uh, for him, for Trotter, they all dealt with subjects like this. Um, that have, again, this kind of American scene, for lack of a better word. But they're also influenced by his instructor, Lamar Dodd, who was working in a similar vein when he was a student, when, when Trotter uh, was a student at, um, uh, at Georgia. He takes a job in 1948, initially in uh, Alabama at uh, Birmingham Southern College. And then he comes to Texas Wesleyan uh, later that year uh, in, in 1948. He still hasn't finished his uh, MFA, um, which is always a, a tricky thing to do, you know, working on a degree and teaching full time. Um, but he, he uh, did work on his degree, and he did finish it in 1950. And it was on watercolors, um, which he did throughout his lifetime, but not nearly as much as oil paintings and casino, uh, 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 paintings based on uh, Cassim, uh, the milk uh, uh, medium. Uh, but he chose watercolors, he said, because he thought they offered the greatest opportunity to experiment with form. 
um, uh, and they had you know a kind of quickness and immediacy that was also quite challenging. Dodd also was a watercolorist. But I'm sure um, he had some influence uh, on him. When he moves to whoops, there um, he moves to Texas. He's at Westland. Um, he paints this painting entitled Flood, Fort Worth, 1949. I wish the slide was showing a little better um, because it, it's a work that, although it's literally more schematic, these are buildings that are under flood, um, in some ways it really reminds me of some of Hogue's work, the Dust Bowl pictures and so forth. And it's, it's another kind of variation perhaps on uh, regionalism. It's based on an actual incident in 1949 there was a horrific flood in Fort Worth. Uh, and so he's really documenting uh, something, but doing it in now a much looser, much more abstract, more minimal style uh, than the other uh, works that he had been uh, creating. In 1950, he does this really haunting, I think, uh, self-portrait um, uh, against a red wall. The wall, uh, which has an arch form, is something that shows up in a lot of his works in the 50s. Uh, and it, it becomes a kind of emblem for the war and the ruins of the war. Um, it, 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 he really ties it uh, uh, to that. Uh, the war did have very much an impact on him. But um, as I say, really, a, 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 in person, it's a really striking uh, composition. And in the um, uh, storage unit, um, tucked away on a shelf, there was this plaster bust that he had done of himself. Um, and I don't know if you remember the clipping we saw uh, where he's painting the easel. There's a bust. Um, it's not that bust, but he was working in sculpture. And it's one of the things that I've really come to admire about him is that throughout his career, he always was experimenting and always working in different media, um, which is really you know, part of modernism, the idea of the tradition of the new and always pushing things, experimenting, um, uh, seeing what you can do uh, in something uh, else. Two works from uh, 1951, uh, two bouquets. This is um, a painting that you always hope this happens. Someone saw the exhibition at TCU and said, I think I have a trotter in my bedroom. Um, and sure enough, they had a trotter in their bedroom. Um, and we're hoping that it will come to TCU. Uh, but it's one of those stories where she was given it by a friend 25 years ago who's deceased, and she needs to talk to their children and doesn't know where they are, so we'll see what happens. But this was actually a painting that um, he included in a number of exhibitions uh, and, and to great success. And it was shown um, uh, a couple of years later in his solo exhibition, at which time the critic for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram wrote that this painting um, intermingles realism with abstraction and becomes almost a springboard for his next three years of work. And you can see in 51, he is really transitioning here. This is um, my landscape. It's almost a grisaille, gray, monotone uh, composition with these um, uh, kind of not squiggly, they're more rec uh, rectilinear, but these little scaffolding-like forms, very 50s. It's, you know, mid-century modern at the time. Uh, we would call it mid-century modern today. And it, it, it even has a kind of decorative quality, and I was delighted when I found a clipping that showed it in a new gallery that opened in Fort Worth called Trends. Hard to go wrong with a name like that. Um, <laughs> that uh, it, it's, um, uh, it was a really kind of an interior decorator's uh, showroom. Um, and it says, will be used as part of the decorative scheme in the shop. Um, this is Ann Williams, who was uh, an artist and who married um, James Jack Boynton uh, in just a couple of years. And she was you know, part of that Fort Worth uh, circle as well. And a couple of other really quite wonderful paintings from the 50s. It's interesting how abstraction, um, and these aren't wholly, abs you know, totally abstract, but how abstraction, um, you know, it, it, has a, it can have a certain look that you can date it. You know that's from the 50s, or you know it's from the 70s, or wherever it is. Um, that notion that's come up in several of the talks about context being 
uh, so in, important. Um, quarry. Uh, Trotter was very good about doing, he kept a little document book, little notebook, where he did a little thumbnail sketch of his works and would indicate the size, the medium, um, and what exhibitions they had been in, um, which is very helpful uh, when you're doing research. Um, he was invited to be in a show of Texas contemporary artists in 1952 that uh, Nodler's uh, gallery, one of the premier galleries in New York at the time, uh, was organizing. Uh, it was held there in the summer, uh, which is always the deadly time for exhibitions, uh, but apparently it got rave reviews from people and it uh, traveled then um, at the request of the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston to Houston. Uh, and then it also traveled by request from the Texas Fine Arts Association. Um, they wanted it to be installed uh, in the Capitol Rotunda in Austin. So it was a major show of Texas artists who were working uh, in a uh, modernistic way. And Trotter was really involved in this group. I mean, he was really a major uh, part of, of this particular group. Um, the other thing that really impressed me in looking through the materials is um, how many um, competitions there were uh, and how many local shows there were. Um, you know, there weren't that many art galleries, um, particularly once you get outside in New York, but even in New York, there weren't, compared to today, it was really very uh, different world. And, and artists would, you know, just naturally submit to a county fair or a state fair. It was a venue, uh, and th that's what you did. But what amazed me was the level of the um, uh, jurors that they got for these uh, exhibitions. Major, major people, artists, curators, museum directors, and, and so forth. Um, this is Andrew Ritchie, uh, who is the director of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So they bring him in um, uh, to look at uh, this show in, for Fort Worth. This was the local show, the 16th annual uh, local show in Tarrant County. And he's looking at these works very closely. Um, this is the work we just saw, or similar to the work we just saw. Um, all three of these are by Mac Trotter. So again, it's, it's sort of like, well, of all the hundreds of works they could have photographed him looking at, he's looking at uh, these works by uh, Mac Trotter. Um, th they were uh, works that, again, the writer in the um, Star Telegram in Fort Worth said, um, she com uh, commented favorably on Trotter's wonderful color and the degrees in difference in subject matters that he takes. Um, this one is called Two Cities. The one in the center is called um, Dry Dock. Uh, and the one on the far right is Beach Castle. So she was impressed that he was working in um, different kinds of subject matters. And the Dallas State Fair, of course, uh, the general was really uh, an important show. Um, he entered uh, Dry Dock in that exhibition. It won the purchase of prize from the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, and here you see Jerry Bywaters as director of the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts, pointing it out to uh, Eileen Lockheim, who was um, a writer, a major critic, uh, writing for uh, the New York Times at the time. Uh, and next to her is um, Albert uh, Dorn, who I was not familiar with, and uh, I was delighted to learn that he was one of the founders um, of the, um, let me get the name right here, uh, I'm not finding it. But anyway, uh, he was one of the founders of um, the, you, you saw these mat, uh, ads in the 1960s or 50s for you too can be an artist. Um, the American uh, Illustrator Artist School. Famous artist school. Famous artist school, thank you. Uh, Norman Rockwell was one of the founders as well. And uh, so he's, the, he's one of the juries who's looking really happy uh, to see this very abstracted um, uh, work there. Um, Elaine, uh, or Aline um, Lockham wrote uh, about being in Texas and she made some, again, apropos of Francine Carraro's talk, um, she made a comment that being to Texas, she came to realize, at least in Texas, that the era of the regionist style is over. This is, you know, writing in 19... Um, uh, 
uh, 54 actually she was writing. Um, individualism has been replaced, excuse me, individualism has replaced regionalism. And she was very impressed particularly with the Fort Worth group of artists. Um, she was invited, it may have been because she was invited to the home of Ted Weiner, Weiner? what happened? Um, and um, he had invited 15 Fort Worth artists to come with two of their works of art. And they were going to play a parlor game where they voted um, the lay people that were there, um, the artists and the art critic, on which were the best works. And they did this kind of uh, round robin voting. And uh, Bill Bomer and Trotter's works were the ones that were rated the highest uh, most consistently. Uh, so she was quite impressed with Texas, although she did end her article by saying, the state seems to me have produced an alive and above average interesting group of artists. <laughs> Sounds like, welcome to Lake Wobegon. <laughs> This is, oh, this, oh, in the New York Times when this appeared in 1953, um, Trotter's work was the work she used to illustrate um, that article about the vital, art, Texas art is vital and growing. He had a one-person show in 1954, which was a big deal uh, for the Fort Worth Art Center because it was considered very much an honor by the center and by artists, and they only did one of these a year and uh, Trotter was uh, uh, selected. Um, this was also one of the last major shows that they had in the public library where the art galleries had been for years and years um, and a new building uh, was being constructed in 54 and opened in 54, designed by the Bauhaus trained architect, um, excuse me, um, Herbert Beyer. And then again, Trotter shows up. I mean, he's everywhere. Uh, he, and they're indicating it really is not linked directly to this article about the new building that says to TCU. So he's leaving Texas Wesleyan, he's going to TCU uh, at this time. But in fact, he was really closely tied to the Art Center. He did a lot, really a lot, of uh, courses there. Um, I mean, he was teaching there almost as much as he was at, at TCU, and he taught on Saturdays as well. He also um, was elected by artists who were members of the Fort Worth Art Association uh, as the president of the group of artists. And that meant he sat on the board of trustees uh, for the art center and he was reelected to that. So he was, he was really um, uh, very well uh, received. And again, uh, just to go back to this show, or whoops, yeah. Um, the critic in the Fort Worth paper said, uh, that we are proud that Trotter now calls Fort Worth home. Uh, so that idea of his um, uh, importance. This is from a brochure the uh, Art Center uh, published talking about their uh, classes, um, uh, their art school uh, education uh, classes, Emily Guthrie Smith, Evelyn Sellers, Brewer Utter, and Mac Trotter. And then these wonderful photographs have come across um, uh, in the uh, archives. Carl Wounds helped me identify um, some of these people, but this is Trotter's wife, um, Sarah, who was an artist. She had gone to TCU. Uh, uh, Jack Boynton, Bill Bomer, um, and Brewer Utter uh, in this work. So it's, he, this is the Fort Worth Circle, as they're called. And they're in Trotter's house, because that's one of Trotter's paintings uh, behind him. Um, Charles Williams, uh, Dick Harris, uh, and uh, John Erickson. Uh, shown a uh, frame there, and then I'd love to know what's going on uh, in this uh, work. It, Trotter's comment um, in the old jail catalog was something in, in the 1986 show, or I think it was, was something about, we had a lot of fun at these parties, and um, there's no doubt about it. This is a photograph that had appeared in the 54 solo exhibition catalog, showing him with a roller. He, really like working at times with a roller. And he would make his own rollers. Some of them were only a quarter of an inch in height. Uh, some were eight inches. Um, he liked that kind of surface um, 
that he could get. He says, I work with masses of value and I get more structure uh, with a roller. And another example of a work of his, this is a casein work. Uh, he liked working with casein on masonite. A lot of his paintings uh, are done um, in, in that way. This is about 18 by 24 um, inches. I brought it in because, um, I'm sorry, this is hard to see, but um, this is a, a, a piece that's about five, maybe five and a half feet uh, in height, a vertical piece. And it's a really, it's a beautiful painting. Um, it's also really intriguing because with the rollers, he's really dealing with horizontality, just the process. Um, but he creates this vertical building of these stacking, these kind of bricks uh, of, of color in a, a really uh, quite um, a remarkable way. Um, I walked out of my hotel room, I'm on the first floor at the Wyndham, and I looked at the carpet this morning, and I thought, oh my gosh, it's a Mac Trotter. Uh, there are all these stripes. That's a sign you've been looking too much. Um, Mark Rothko is sometimes cited, the students cite him in the catalog, as um, an artist that there's an affinity. I, you know, Trotter probably saw, I mean, I'd be surprised if he didn't, uh, reproductions of Rothko's work. He may have seen it when he went to New York a couple of times as, as well. And, you know, there's some, there are some similarities to be sure, but there are also some significant differences. Uh, Rothko's work typically has that more feathered uh, edge to it. And whereas as Trotter um, really acknowledged that a work like this on the uh, right-hand side was uh, dealt with the landscape, um, that's something that Rothko would not have said, would never have gone uh, in that direction. It was more open-ended. For him, it was more spiritual, ultimately. Um, Trotter made the comment that, although my work is abstract, my painting is an essence of Southwest landscape. Um, he's really part of that notion that the art historian John McCurry said many years ago, uh, the land is the great protagonist of our art in America. And he's doing that, but he's abstracting it. The abstract expressionists were mentioned by um, Eleanor in her talk. Um, this is a picture of that happy group. Uh, and they were, um, in 1950, they weren't really dominating the way they came to be within just a few years, but they certainly were a force to be reckoned with. And people realized that these were, they were still considered young, not so much chronologically, but in reputation, young uh, artists. And this was, they were protesting an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum about un being unfair to contemporary uh, art. Um, and, and again, th these are people that were becoming known in art magazines and, and so forth, and Trotter would have I've been familiar with them. I brought that in though um, purpose, or on purpose to connect to, in 1954, he also was shown in the Guggenheim Museum um, as part of a very large uh, invitational exhibition that James Johnson Sweeney, the director of the Guggenheim, organized. There were 54 painters um, from 21 cities across um, uh, the country uh, and uh, Trotter, uh, and two other Texans, both from Fort Worth at the time, Jack Boynton uh, and John Erickson, were also included in that exhibition. So they were the only Texans. But there were West Coast, um, Southern and, and Northwest, and East Coast as well. What's really fascinating to me, I was just thunderstruck, actually, dumbstruck, when I uh, opened the catalog. And I had forgotten how you, a lot of older catalogs, they will have you know, the artists who participated, their signatures, and then they reproduce them and they put them in the, the catalog. And I was just struck by um, who was in this um, uh, exhibition. Um, on the top part, uh, Richard Diebenkorn's name is mentioned, James Brooks, who was an abstract expressionist, uh, is mentioned. Um, Franz Klein is on the right side, de Kooning on the bottom of the right side. Philip Gustin uh, was in this exhibition. Uh, on the image below, Jackson Pollock's signature is on the bottom, um, and there's Mac Trotter's on the other side. Um, a pretty prestigious company uh, for the time. He uh, probably, uh, as a result of that exhibition, had a solo exhibition in New York in 1956 uh, at Grand Central Moderns, um, a con a more contemporary gallery for part of a more traditional gallery. 
on 57th Street, West 57th. Uh, and it, uh, one of the paintings include was uh, this painting, again, a vertical composition, which actually has a kind of Pollock gestural quality to it where it, it, it a little bit better. Uh, he got a favorable review from um, the uh, New York Herald Tribune. Um, it's unsigned except for initials EG. I've been trying to figure out if that's Eugene Goosen, who was an art critic and writer. Um, I'm not sure he was in New York then. Uh, but he writes, however brash and boastful the average Texan is, according to popular impression, Texas artists are among the most sensitive and soft-spoken in the country. Sounds like fighting words. Um, <laughs> McKee Trotter, showing at Grand Central Moderns, is one of the best. Um, and then he goes on to say, uh, he admires the large areas of subtle color interjected with delicate linear patternings to suggest an almost orientalist, oriental, I should say, understatement. The broad spaces, endless fencing, uh, fencing sweeping uh, skies. So it was very favorably uh, received. And then in 1957, he was included in Life magazine in um, a, a six-page article about the American Federation of Art holding a, its conference in Houston. And then uh, a number of the people traveling around looking at art from around the state. It was a very positive article uh, about um, uh, Texas art. But at the bottom of one of the, actually the uh, really most important page um, is uh, work by um, uh, Mac Trotter, and then, um, which is on the far right, um, Otis Dozier and Michael Furry's work uh, are uh, in them. And then on the other side were um, works by other um, uh, Texas artists as well. Turnout for art, very positive. There's something to me wonderfully ironic about Marcel Duchamp uh, showing up in this uh, and also explaining his work, which is entitled Why, Why Not Sneeze, Rose C'est la Vie, uh, to these women in their white gloves who look enthralled. Uh, apparently, he was very charismatic. Again, it's, it's hard to read these slides, but um, continuing to work in this way that sometimes these are pine trees. Uh, you, they're more recognizable. Other times, it's more hinted at um, um, in his work. He made the comment, I believe in neither the real or the abstract, but in universalities. Uh, to me, there must be time for contemplation and an approach which is humility, in which humility plays a strong part. My painting, therefore, is both real and abstract, and neither side permanently retaining uh, the upper hand. That appeared in uh, an article Jerry Bywaters wrote for Art in America. And then a really striking work um, that's quite large, it's about eight feet across, um, by Trotter from 1957 with the Southwestern Landscape uh, as the title. And then he, he did lots of variations on a theme, and he would come back to certain paintings, certain themes. Um, fields, for example, um, working them in, a, in really a variety of, of ways. Um, uh, the work on the um, uh, right-hand side um, is, is striking, I, I think. And then he was included, again, in other shows, still very active. He was showing a lot. He was really getting his reputation uh, becoming nationally known. He was included in a major show of artist teachers um, at the uh, State University of Oswego. And this is a, instead of signatures, they had um, photographs of, of people, trotters in the third from the left on, on the bottom uh, there. And then in this uh, show, uh, Texas um, uh, painting and sculpture in 1968. It's a really interesting catalog to look at because you know, 68 is a moment when a lot of things are happening. Um, it's a really beginning a, a, a change in Texas uh, art, I think. And modernism is beginning. You know, changing into uh, modernism or being overwhelmed. As I meant to mention, the, the Life magazine writers said, um, you're more apt now, uh, or, or you're, um, in, if you go to Texas today, you'll see less paintings of blue bonnets and more of oil derricks um, 
So the economy is changing as well. But in looking at this, uh, there are artists like um, Bob Daddy O. Wade are in this 1968 show. Ed Blackburn was in the show. I was talking with Ed Blackburn uh, just Thursday night, actually. And I mentioned I was doing this talk. And he goes, oh, Mac. And I said, did you know him? He goes, no. And um, he said, I knew his work. But it really wasn't of interest to me, because Ed was doing something very different, something that ultimately is going to be known as postmodernism. And, um, but he said something really uh, nice, I thought. He said, I didn't know him, but you know, he was, a, he was the real deal. Uh, he was really good at what he did. And it was one artist, and, and Ed is a very serious artist who's all about painting. And his comment, I thought, was really a, a nice comment coming from one artist about the other. Uh, Ed also mentioned he really liked some of um, Mac's work that he saw in the, in the 80s, and Mac still showed in the um, uh, TCU uh, faculty exhibitions. Um, and he had done these little collage pieces and little paintings, and he really liked those uh, a lot. This is, again, a little difficult to read, but um, it, it's tiny. It's about um, it, not even eight inches across. And it is, I saw this and I thought it was an abstract painting, and then it says scotch tape. Um, <laughs> So he's taken a scotch tape uh, dispenser, but it says it's a sketch for an acrylic painting, eight by eight. And this would have been a really interesting painting to see uh, had he done it. And it, I, I was excited by this because, you know, 1987, he's getting very close to retirement, um, and he's, he's still thinking of these ideas. And I, I think a lot of things, in, a lot of his work in the 80s was very experimental. He also was always experimenting with sculpture, at least in drawings for sculpture. I brought this in by way of comparison. It's a painting that's in the Modern Art Museum in Fort Worth uh, by Ellsworth Kelly from 1963. It was acquired by the museum in 1968, so Mac would have known this work, and it may have been his own kind of, um, you know, I can do that kind of thing, um, uh, I, you know, experimenting with it. But um, the collages are really uh, quite wonderful. And again, they're, they're small works. Usually, this is six by eight and a half on graph paper. And he'll collage something on top of it. Uh, he, it was part of what he was calling a palette series. It would have been great if he had shown these uh, all as a, um, a, a group. Um, collage is also something he had always worked with. But he really kind of brought it back, I think, in the mid to later uh, 80s. And I really like the play with these you know, rectilinear geometric um, chunks in the middle, and then this very swirling brushy form, and then you've got the graph uh, paper uh, uh, around it. Um, it. It sort of reminds me of a, of a statement he made for when we moved into our new building in 1981. The faculty had a show, and everyone contributed an artist statement. Uh, and his art, artist statement was written almost like it was a, a free-form poem. He said, it's, it read, the implicit rather than the explicit, within, not without, questions posed, no answers, recognition, response may be dualistic, openings are entrance exit, open close, ambivalence. And I think some of these collages reflect this. This one, I, act, I, I really like this work. And, um, it is tiny. Again, it's um, uh, six and a half by six inches. And it's, a, it's sandpaper collaged on what he says is uh, silk screened paper. Um, he was always very good about indicating what his, his medium um, uh, was. But it has a kind of delicate quality, but also toughness. And it reminded me that um, uh, in, in one of the reviews of his show, in the New York Times review of his show in New York in 1956, um, the critic wrote that his oil paintings, um, uh, he referred to his oils as having, quote, a grainy texture of sandpaper fineness. Uh, and I thought, you know, maybe he's coming back to that. But it, it's a, it, it's, it holds up very well at this scale, but at this intimate level, uh, it's really quite extraordinary. So again, this huge range from realism or a form of modernist realism 
to abstraction, lots of stops in between, lots of diversity um, um, uh, stylistically and in terms uh, of, of material. Uh, and, um, it, it, you know, it, it, what I've gained from looking at his work is that it's just a sheer pleasure to look at. I wish he had shown more um, in the 1980s. I think um, he would have found a new audience um, uh, once again. It would have been really uh, 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 quite wonderful. Um, he, I wanted to end with uh, words that uh, he made because he, he was teaching all the time and he, he was very serious as a teacher. Um, and in fact, I came across a page ripped out of a notebook and it said something like, art, had, art education has ruined more artists than you can believe. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, this, and he taught art education for a while. But he, he wrote this, uh, made this comment. In part, what he was aiming to do, he said in 1987, uh, in terms of teaching, imparting a strong sense of continuous involvement, commitment, as art as an attitude and a way of life will be of greater significance to students than any amount of technical proficiency. I like that a lot. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much.